Ladakh has been made into a union territory over three years ago. And that has been something that the people of Ladakh and also leaders of Ladakh have been asking for nearly 70 years. And almost, if I may say, suddenly it was granted to them uh, in October 2019. While uh, people took some time to grasp the, uh, you know, the story around it and what might happen uh, going forward, the biggest reason why people wanted an autonomy or the Union Territory was to safeguard the place, the land and the culture of the people there. But that seems to be the problem right now. And that has been the biggest ask. And what really was, uh, what really were the people of Ladakh asking for? And which is why fresh protests now have risen in both Leh and Kargil. And joining this protest is environmentalist and education reformer, Mr. Sonam Wangchuk, who has announced that he will go on a hunger strike for five days starting from 25th January. Let's move on to him and ask him that why is he doing this and what is he expecting from it? Mr. Mongchuk, welcome to Business Standard. Thanks, Nazia. Thanks. Uh, yes, you rightly said that people of Ladakh wanted UT and they got it. And they're truly grateful to the government for doing that. But I think it was not a complete UT that they wanted, and that's been the issue. I have always, over the last 30 years, observed that whenever the question of UT came, people were asking for UT with its own safeguards. Uh, and that was supposed to come from the uh, basis that 95% uh, of the people in Ladakh are tribal. And for indigenous tribal people, our constitution is so evolved that it goes out of way to protect such sensitive, fragile people and their regions through the Article 244, uh, Schedule 6 and Schedule 5. So people were always sure that, of course, someone who gives UT will also give that uh, safeguards. Um, that's why the issue is. And even government of India was, I think, aware of that and that is the reason why initially soon after the declaration there were everywhere in the news that uh, law ministry tribal ministry home ministry all were considering uh six schedule for ladakh and suddenly it went all quiet and that's what people are concerned now why something that was promised and it was always uh, for two times the top agenda in the election manifestos of BJP. So the government that could give them this freedom, it was easier for them to give this safeguards. So that's what the, um, um, the, the appeal, I would say, to the government is. And it has been three years of silence and it's becoming worse and worse by the day. For example, one was the safeguards that people expected and was not there. Second was that it was always a demand for UT with legislation where people's representatives will decide their fate through an assembly like in Pondicherry. But we found that it is without legislation, which means there is no democracy. Actually, democracy wise, we are a little uh, regressed now. We used to have four MLAs and two MLCs, I think, none of that is there. Um, so it's really not as per people's wishes that development should go on. So therefore, the legislature part of the UT was missing. And as time went and there was no response, now people are demanding statehood, although that was not initially, but seeing that it is um, not what they expected. So I, I really feel if the center had declared the safeguards that are due for the tribal region and the legislature that was always part of the demand were also fulfilled. It would have been all rosy and, uh, you know, gratitude everywhere. Yes, I, I remember how when uh, when Ladakh did get uh, the union territory or the autonomy, there was a lot of cheer 
uh, among the people of Ladakh. They thought that, okay, there is something that is being done for the region right now. Uh, mm -hmm. But what also needs to be understood here is that Ladakh is uh, in extreme need of this safeguard, uh, because, not only because of, uh, you know, the people or the economy, but also because of the climate, also because of the environmentally how, uh, you know, Ladakh is positioned. Uh, so, you know, you bring that out in your discussion and that is something that needs to be understood uh, by the people uh, to understand where Ladakh is environmentally and uh, what needs to be done to protect and safeguard uh, Ladakh's environment. Exactly, Ladakh is almost a different planet altogether. All if I look out of my window here, it's more like Mars or Moon than planet Earth. So just uh, square kilometers of land doesn't mean anything. It has to be livable. And what makes this desert livable is water. And that here comes from the glaciers, not from rains or anything. And our glaciers are melting very fast because of the global warming and local pollution and uh, emission. So land is meaningless if you don't have water. And due to shortage of water, already some villages are abandoning their own villages, becoming climate refugees. So at this rate, in 30, 40 years, people of Ladakh may have to move. If suddenly industries were all allowed free hand here, then these glaciers will be gone. The industries will make their money in the next one or two decades. But people who have to live here will be left as uh, helpless refugees. And that's the challenge with democracy also, I think. Leaders look at their next five years. So they will call it development because it earns, but only in the next five years. If you look at next 30 or 50 years, then it's a, it's a you know, liability. You're seeing what is happening in Joshimat and other places. So short-term development and revenue but long-term disaster is what we should avoid, and that's what is called wisdom. We should not use just our intelligence for short-term gains, but our wisdom for long-term harmony and sustenance of the place and the people. We should really learn our lessons from uh, episodes like Joshimut, uh, a place where environmentalists have been saying for many, many years that how Joshimut will end up exactly how it ended up. But still uh, the developments continued, still uh, the government had pushed for it to become what it is. Now people are left on their own, they are left without their houses. And we've seen a similar case in Ladakh in, in, in a smaller way though, where people are having to leave their houses because of water shortages, uh, because of all the development that we're seeing around and tourism being one of the biggest uh, drivers for economy there. So um, do you see that we really need the government and people of the country really need to learn our lessons from, uh, from places like Joshimat? Uh, do, you, do you think that there is a lot that needs to be done on that front? Yeah, exactly. Just the other day, I was looking at a Prime Minister's 10-point agenda on uh, disaster management. And I was so impressed that the ninth point there says, from each disaster, we should learn lessons. Don't lose the lesson, even if you lose life and property. Now, that's a very wise thing to say. And we definitely should learn from each disaster like Joshimat and learn for places like Ladakh so that we do not exploit the place for the short term and think of it as a raise in GDP or revenues and then later pay five times more. Or th there's no value you can associate to a people becoming, you know, disassociated with their uh, place. Absolutely. Now, I just want to, uh, you know, in order to get an idea of how Ladakh has progressed uh, and also, you know, the climate uh, issues that Ladakh is facing environmentally, you have been in Ladakh for over 50 years on and off, mostly on. Uh, so tell us about how Ladakh has changed over the years. Oh, in every way. And it is just the tip of the iceberg if it was to be opened for freehand, uh, you know, development. So even with tourism alone, uh, 
uh, we see so much of uh, exploitation of resources like water, moving of population from rural areas to urban areas, increasing the pressure on urban areas. Like Leh was a 5,000 people town or village. Today it is roughly 50,000. And in summers it is 150,000. The value of Leh is not designed to take that kind of load. On the other hand, the villages are going empty. So it's a blind short-term vision development. Now add to that all kinds of industries like mining and you know what you have you. And then to run those things, people will come from everywhere. And this place can hardly support its three lakh people. There's hardly any water. So as I said, without water, this land is meaningless. So Ladakh will be left of no one, not for Ladakhis, not for any people who come here. It will become a barren thing of disasters. Yes. Now, let me come to your announcement that you're going on a hunger strike. Tell us a little bit about that event itself. It's starting on the 26th of January. What are you going to do and where is it going to take place? Uh, you know, we'll then after that head on to what are you hoping to achieve from uh, this initiative? First of all, I wouldn't call it a hunger strike. I would call it a fast and climate fast in solidarity with our glaciers and to convey a message to the government and the people of India and the world to be um, sensitive to this fragile land. Um, therefore, I'll be in solidarity uh, to express this sentiment as enshrined in our constitution um, we'll be doing a peaceful, silent, uh, lonely um, fast, a climate fast for five days um, on Khardungla, which is home to many glaciers. So I've always um, made my messages to the world from this valley because this is what the Leh Valley depends on. So once again, I hope to go there and you know, you have to draw the attention of government and people somehow. Uh, otherwise, we just go around with business as usual and it doesn't work. So therefore, I'm inflicting a little pain on myself, not on anybody else. You know, people go to all lengths of hijacking planes or taking hostages. I'm just inflicting some pain on myself and nobody else to draw the attention of A, this is what I'm hoping from this exercise. A, that the government pays attention to this case and uh, listens to the, uh, the, the agenda of the leaders of Ladakh, which is about six schedule uh, safeguards based on tribal population of Ladakh and few other demands. So government gives an assurance to discuss on the, those agendas and not just anything like it has been happening for the last three years. Uh, so the safeguards under six schedule of the Indian constitution, which the government had itself promised in various ways, including election manifesto. So nothing like uh, earth shattering here, their own promise. Secondly, it's not just government you know, it's more people in the big cities in India and abroad that's causing our fragile nature to crumble. So I'm also expecting um, on 26 January pledges from the people to change their lifestyle, to change from climate unfriendly, you know, lifestyle as if there is no tomorrow to sensitive, sensible living on this planet. For example, as I always keep saying, um, choosing to walk when you don't have to take a car, choosing to take bicycles, choosing to take trains instead of aeroplanes, planting trees. And I want everybody to be engaged with uh, us in solidarity of our glaciers on this 26th January. I would expect 
while I'm doing this climate fast at 18,000 feet, people in various um, cities and organizations, schools, and so on, observe a one day fast uh, for safeguarding the Himalayas. Mind you, Himalayan glaciers are what feeds 2 billion people. Um, now, 1 billion in the Indian subcontinent and 1 billion on the northern side in the Chinese side. That's one fourth of the population of the world. If these glaciers melt fast, it will be like suicidal. First, we'll go. But next, 100 crore people in India will be directly affected. So I want them to be concerned also and join me in my fast on 26 January and pledge to change their ways. It's not just government and the prime minister who can safeguard our environment here. People also, children. For example, children can you know, move grown-ups to see the need for such steps. They can, I was giving examples, you know, often children eat half and throw half the food. Now, agriculture is such a polluting industry. And if you just throw half your food, and then it doesn't make sense. You could have done half the agriculture and melted half the glaciers. So children, grown-ups, men, women, I want all to also join me on this 26 January. That's my other appeal, uh, uh, apart from appealing to the prime minister to give an assurance that they'll discuss with our leaders on these issues. Well, yes, of course, you have been uh, obviously a cha champion in terms of uh, the climate, uh, you know, environment that we have seen, and especially coming from Ladakh, where it is right now seeing a, a, a big, big, big challenge in terms of the water crisis that Ladakh is facing right now. And uh, while you have explained, uh, you know, through the talk that how is Ladakh, uh, what are the challenges that Ladakh faces, and that needs to be sort of uh, put across to the government and the prime minister. You have been yourself uh, a big uh, supporter of uh, Narendra Modi. So let's hope that he listens to you and uh, you know uh, you are able to get the attention that Ladakh needs uh, right now. Uh, any last message that you want to give uh, to the people? While you have said that you know maybe people should also fast uh, and support uh, you know in terms of uh, the climate change that we are seeing and uh, maybe support for Ladakh. Anything else that you want to add before you leave? Yeah, I want to make it not just some demand from the government, more from people. And the prime minister himself, I'm so impressed, launched this uh, movement for lifestyle change called LIFE, Lifestyle for Environment at the COP27. No other world leader has gone down to people's lifestyles. So... I would like people to support that and change their lifestyles uh, for climate friendly actions. And we have uh, made a platform where they can do so. It's called ilivesimply.org, where you can go and pledge to change your lifestyle for the planet. So truly, I want it to be a people's movement and not just few Ladakhis asking something from the government. So my message to people in the big cities is please live simply in the big cities so we in the mountains simply live. Thank you so much, Mr. Wangchu, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.